We continue with Unit 2, Data Management. And I should warn you, uh, spoiler alert, if you haven't done Lab 2, maybe stop this for a moment. Uh, just do the first exercise of Lab 2, 2.1. Uh, and once you have done that, then watch this video. Because otherwise uh, you deprive yourself of a potential learning experience. Now after that, uh, we'll cover what statistical concepts are implied by data tables and we go over variable types. So there's a whole number of aspects and also important vocabulary that we cover in this video. And I'll mark these videos that you should probably review at some point before the final exam, for example. Um, so I mark them with a star so it makes it a little bit easier to find the videos that are packed with information that is important and that you should remember. There are not too many videos like that where I ask you to learn vocabulary but a few, and that's an important one here. So the first thing that you uh, done in lab two was actually to enter some data. And I set a bit of a trap there for you. So I've displayed this in design format and usually a substantial portion of the class actually enters the data in design format, but that gets you stuck. So you can't proceed, R doesn't know what to do with this. So you do have to convert this into a standard data table format. And uh, just so that you are not really getting stuck if you are doing this online. Um, I do want to show you the solution, how far that should look like. So you have to have separate columns for each variable. And the obvious ones are farm and variety uh, from that experiment. And then also yield. Um, this, this would actually be enough uh, for you to get through lab two. But if you were to do this uh, for real in a proper experimental setup, uh, you would also add more information about your experiment itself. So one additional variable that you might want to put in is a replication number. And so it's not mandatory, but it helps you understand your own design. So um, if you have four times that variety uh, in randomized plots, so you have four replications, it's good to have this type of information. It's also good to have a plot number. And in this case, I have ordered my plot numbers the way I want to go through the experiment. So my first plot and maybe in the top left corner would be P1. Um, and then I continue to go to P2 and the treatments are randomized set. And then obviously you can combine all this information into an ID that's always recommended. Usually you want all descriptive information about that particular plot. So what I put here is which farm it is in, which um, plot it is in and which uh, treatment there is. And I could sort this by um, that ID. I organize my way like this and then this would become a data entry sheet so I would start with plot one plot two plot three and so forth so later in the lab you were asked to enter some more data and this is how that should have looked like so this was a, a sample that went uh, to the lab where protein content was assessed for a subset of your plots and you would need the exact same ID and then the protein also in this kind of standard data table and this is exactly what you need the ID for, right? So you take a sample of your crop, you put it in a paper bag, you put it in a drying oven and dry it, then you'll take it out, it needs to be ground, then you transfer to a vial and ship it to the lab, and then the results come back. And the ID is what holds it all together, right? So that ID that goes onto your sample, it goes onto your paper bag, it goes onto the vial. So there's never any doubt what that is. So even if you lose documentation, you mix up your records, the ID will always allow you to tie it back to where it came from, right? And it's much better than just a number, which could be confused. So this is a perfect example uh, of how to use it. And lastly, there was some metadata that uh, I asked you to merge in. And this did not need an ID because the uh, identifier was at the farm level. So the farm was at a particular latitude, longitude, and elevation. So this becomes your ID for this particular uh, operation. So after you did all the merge commands, this uh, would have been how your final data table could have looked like. There's a bit more information in here than is necessary. So I highlighted the ones that you definitely need. And the rest of the variables, if you design your own experiments, are optional. So these are just additional pieces of information. So this is also called a flat file, where uh, all the information you have is merged together. And uh, you can see that there's some redundancy here. Uh, so this is all the same information for farm one and farm two. 
And in the past, when there were hard drive storage limitations and computers couldn't quite keep up with files as big, you had relational databases that kept all these things separate, so the way they were before, merging. But these days, I think it's good practice to have everything in one place. So when you work with your own data, create a big flat file with all the information in it, uh, just like this one here in this exercise. Okay, so I said in the beginning that data tables imply certain statistical concepts, so let's, let's talk about those. And that comes with a little bit of vocabulary. I try to keep this minimal, but you do need some statistical vocabulary and some statistical definitions in order to uh, talk about your projects, uh, talk to me, talk to other analysts. So let's start with rows and columns. Columns of a data table are variables. And rows represent units. And so what's implied by units is that they are independent entities. So they are study subjects. They can be plots. They could be animals. They could be locations. They could be trees. So they are objects that are independent of each other. And there are two types of these units. One of them you call experimental. And B, sampling units. So depending on what type of research you do, uh, you may have experimental units or sampling units. So we went with this agricultural experiment here. So that's an experiment where you control almost everything. But if you are working, for example, uh, with grizzly bears, this would pose a logistical challenge. So in that case, you emulate experimental designs through sampling. So you don't actually lay out an experiment, but you use the natural environment to pick particular locations that are contrasting, uh, that represent different habitat conditions, for example, and then you see how that influences your grizzly bear populations. Another example is if you're not working with lentil varieties, but with uh, Douglas firs that uh, grow 100 years old, so you may not have the patience to watch those trees grow to maturity. So there are a lot of examples where your statistics are based on a sampling design rather than an experimental design, which you control completely. So there are typically three types of variables and uh, your first block of variables here, those tend to be design variables or metadata. Your second block are the independent variables or they're also called predictor variables. And your last block are the dependent variables, or um, also called response variables. So those are synonyms. They mean the same thing. Dependent variable, response variable, independent variable is the same as predictor variable. And just for completeness, uh, we should also find what this is. So this is a datum or what you measure. So the measurement you take on your study subjects, they are called a datum, or the plural is obviously data. So that is what a cell represents. Okay, to round this off, I have some formal definitions for you. And the first one is what a variable is. So that's an attribute of your experimental or sampling unit, so something that describes your sampling or experimental units. Um, so the experimental or sampling unit themselves, those are the individuals, objects, things, locations. So whatever you measure or what you study, those are your units. And then uh, lastly, we have uh, data. Data are simply the values of the variables. And then last but not least, we can uh, distinguish our variables into independent and dependent variables, so predictor and response variables. And the independent ones are the things that you think are the cause of something. And the dependent variables are what you measure. So you may not actually be right about that those environmental conditions or whatever your manipulations are have an effect, but that is your working hypothesis. So independent and dependent variables are uh, defined by your working hypothesis. In reality, it, sometimes it can be the other way around. And you'll notice that in the course of your research or study. Oftentimes in ecologies, things are actually quite interconnected. But nevertheless, what counts is what you think. So that's the way you should order them and you should treat them. And the results may, may tell a different story, but that is fine.
Okay, so let's also give some examples for independent and dependent variables. So one thing that I do is studying the effect of climate variables on a drought response and my uh, units are tree species. But you could also study water pollutants um, and look at the frequency of fish species as an effect. Or just to give a completely different example yet, uh, soil properties as independent variable, erosion would be your dependent uh, variable and your study subjects may be logging roads. And of course we had our agricultural experiment here as well, where we had environments so represented by different farms, maybe a dozen farms, dozen experimental farms across the country and varieties, so that represents genetics as independent uh, factors. And our response variables would be yield and protein content that you record for different plantal varieties. So what you should be familiar with now is how to uh, properly enter a data table, and what the different variable categories are, how they relate to your uh, experimental design, and you can also see that that's a universal format. So whatever kind of science you do, the data tables that you work with will look like that. And um, that is also helpful because once you understand it, you can work with anybody's data. And this consistency is also helpful for the programmers that develop software. So they assume this arrangement of your data. Okay, and the last thing I want to do is talk about variable types. So in this particular case, our uh, independent variables are nominal variables, so they have a name. You can also use the synonyms class variable or categorical variable or factor variable. Factor variable is used in R. And uh, you normally have continuous uh, variables as well, so those are numbers. And um, one thing I should point out, it's actually a bad idea to use a number for a nominal variable. So if you have entered under the farm uh, variable one and two, uh, that is actually not a brilliant idea because R recognizes it as a continuous variable and it will do a different type of analysis. So for example, in this case, an analysis of variance and a linear regression would be the same command in R. And depending on what variable type it is, it will either do an ANOVA or a linear regression. Uh, so you may get surprising results if you use numbers for what are really nominal variables. And farm is a nominal variable. So correct this if you did get that wrong in your own data entry because we will use this uh, data sheet that you generated for quite a few things. Uh, the other thing that R distinguishes uh, among the continuous variables are integers and numeric variables. So numeric variables are real numbers, so they can have a decimal point. Integers would be whole numbers, positive and negative, and uh, you can check that in R with the structure command, so str, that will give you either an integer, a numeric, or a factor variable, or there's also logical variables if you have true and false variables. And maybe one more interesting thing about factor variables, uh, that's also something that's unique to R, is that R treats it internally as a dual variable, so you have both the character that's being displayed, the character string, and you have a number associated with it, and the number is by default alphabetically. That is sometimes really advantageous, so for graphics uh, this can be very handy, but on the other hand that also can sometimes lead to a bit of confusion. Um, you don't see the numbers in the background, but they are there. Now it used to be that when you read in a data table from a C3 file to R, that by default it would make character variables factor variables, but it doesn't do that anymore since version 4. So now the default is character, and if you do want that double variable, which can really be handy, especially for graphics, then you have to manually convert the variable to a factor with an S factor command on that variable. And in addition to what R thinks about variables, there are actually further important variable distinctions in statistics. You have three types of uh, numerical variables. Uh, one is ratio scale, uh, then you have interval scale and ordinal scale. And uh, what distinguishes ratio scale variables is that they do have a meaningful zero. So just to give an example, we have precipitation here. Um, if I have zero precipitation, it means I got nothing. So for those variables, all types of statistics are allowed. For interval scale a variable, that's a different story. Um, so they have an arbitrary zero value. For example, temperature in degrees Celsius would be an example for this. And in that case, you can't 
do any manipulations or calculations where you multiply or where you divide or where you use percentages. So all statistics that include those things are actually not allowed. So for example, a coefficient of variation includes a percentage. So you can't uh, calculate that. You are also restricted in terms of what you can do in, uh, for data transformations. Um, otherwise you create all kinds of artifacts. And I can give you an example. 10 degrees Celsius is not five times as warm as two degrees Celsius, right? So that doesn't make any sense um, because you have an arbitrary zero value that somebody set simply where water freezes. And then last but not least, we have uh, ordinal scale variables. So those are rank orders. Um, for example, a grade or a quality or a score. Those are numbers. Uh, you can, for example, get a GPA, which is even a real number. Um, but technically, you're not allowed to do any parametric statistics on those types of variables because they do have, in their raw form, they have gaps and they tend not to be normally distributed. Now, in the real world, you can actually ignore the theoretical statistician's objections and do uh, parametric statistics just fine with those variables uh, uh, very successfully. And I give you a little bit of a tip uh, on how to do this. So if you are in the field and you record a quality score, let's say you score trees in a genetic experiments for uh, stem straightness or quality. Now what you do for this is you look through maybe the first block of your plantation and you figure out what's a normal stem straightness or uh, stem quality, what's a bit lower, what's a bit higher, what's substantially lower, what's substantially higher and what's really exceptionally rare. So those are the things that you that, that you score with perhaps plus and minus one, plus and minus two, plus and minus three. Um, so that way you force a normal distribution on your ordinal data. And, uh, and what you can do when you're done with your experiment, you go back to some of your individual scores and take more elaborate measurements of what that represents. For example, a particular angle uh, or something like that. And uh, that way you have a normal distribution and you have uh, a quick scoring method that allow you to uh, collect lots of data. And you also have a precise metric what those scores represent that you can report.